Meanwhile, we check in monthly with Representative Dr. John Bison, and today is the day. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Richard. Thanks. Always great to be back with you again. Thanks for being here. We appreciate that very much. Uh, and we check in with you and, and uh, Representative Maturin once a month. And uh, even though you're on appropriations and he's not, we did ask about uh, his view of the budget. But yours is uh, particularly succinct because you are on the appropriations committee so this has been what you've been involved in a lot of the time now uh, this has taken up a great deal of time up there and it sucks a lot of the uh, air out of the room whenever <laughs> you're up there um, <laughs> you know i had in the past made the comment that in some ways the appropriations process is uh, like uh, almost like a little bit of cocaine where <laughs> You get uh, a little bit and you say, wow, this is really pretty nice. And uh, uh, you just can't quite seem to get enough of it after uh, oh, that point. Boy. And uh, mm. so uh, there is an entire industry built around uh, our budget process. And mm. uh, we try very, very hard to make sure that uh, we do well for our citizens. And, and that would be my major focus while I'm up there. We need to do well for our people. And uh, that's taken a, a great deal of time. And, you know, you have... A, a lot of different competing camps because there's a finite number of dollars that we run through. The governor uh, came out uh, back in January, February with his uh, budget recommendations. And now over the last uh, couple months, uh, we have been on the Senate side and the House side looking at those individual numbers and uh, trying to uh, make uh, sense of all the programs that they do fund. And uh, we came up with uh, recommendations that, again, are increases from what we had last year. Uh, I think that we're looking at putting another $200 million towards the various programs. Uh, and that's going to give us uh, maybe a 1% increase, uh, which will be pretty close to the rate of inflation. But we were able to do some very, very new and exciting things in many of the budgets. Um, <laughs> education uh, out of the House is going to look different than education out of the Senate. Uh, I believe that the Senate went along with the governor's uh, 2X program where uh, the poor schools get $100 uh, per student and the, and the uh, Better off districts get fifty dollars uh, per uh, student uh, under this formulation, and uh, Tim Kelly, who runs that uh, particular budget, uh, was looking at it, and this has been going on year after year. And he has some concerns that perhaps we are are not keeping up for all of our students, and so uh, he is recommending a hundred dollars uh, to all of the students mm. uh, with some additional benefits to uh, uh, those who need it as well. And uh, so that'll be one of the points of contention between the two budgets. And, and, and that's how this works. There's yeah. the governor's version, Senate, House, and all try to meet in the middle somehow. And uh, I am sure that we will, and we will do it on time. And I'm sure that we are going to uh, get it done. There is a uniform agreement that uh, we have certain priorities, and educational funding is one of them. And we want to make sure that we have more dollars uh, uh, going uh, to the classrooms more dollars uh, helping our children with their education. And education is one of the areas that we have been falling way behind in. And I, I don't think that it's necessarily just a dollar amount that, uh, because there gets to be a certain point at which time additional dollars don't make the kids smarter. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that the kids have the uh, other supports they need to be in an environment where they can uh, learn. Of course, one of the main topics I'm guessing that you hear about and that I hear about is going to be roads and road funding. Yeah. And we need to uh, make sure that we have additional revenues. And uh, Chase Hernandez was the uh, representative who uh, was looking at the transportation budget this time. Um, he reminded me something that I had forgotten about uh, in that uh, the state owns five aircraft. And those aircraft uh, make about uh, um, six, seven hundred uh, trips per year wow. to various places. But he says uh, we might very well be able to do this with uh, three aircraft rather than five. And so in his budget, I believe we're going to be uh, getting rid of uh, two aircraft uh, if the Senate were to adopt it. And I'm, I'm pretty certain that the Senate hasn't uh, looked at this as of yet. Another thing that he had uh, done is go, uh, gone through the MDOT budget and said, and said, 
how many of these people are actually there and how many of these people are slots that we are funding. And it turns out that we had about 191 people in the MDOT uh, that are allocated for services but are not filled right now. And he uh, hmm. he's saying, uh, well, maybe we need to look at this. And if we got rid of those 191 slots, then we would be able to put another $20 million towards the roads. And he said, I kind of like that. And hmm. uh, so he uh, put that into the uh, transportation budget. Those are vacant uh, positions. Those are, are vacant positions I that see. right now are unfilled at, at the various levels. And, uh -huh. you know, there are those who would say you don't want to hamstring our uh, state government as well. But if you're functioning without those positions, the question then becomes, are they really necessary and are they needed? You know, if you're doing okay without them, then maybe we need to look and see if uh, if something needs to be trimmed here. And, I, you know, I, I loved his innovative approach, if nothing else. Yeah, interesting. We're talking with Representative Dr. John Bison today. You can join us if you have a question. 441-9595 is the number. Representative Dr. John Bison is here, and uh, Carla is on the line with a question. Good morning, Carla. Good morning. Hi, Dr. Bison. It's Carla Sales with the Area Agency on Aging. Oh, it's always great to talk to you. Thank you so much, Carla, for calling in this morning. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, Governor Schneider has had an initiative to make Michigan a no-wait state for aging services, and I know there's been some... Um, increases proposed in the Department of Health and Human Services budget. I'm just wondering how that uh, fell out in your efforts um, within the House. Um, in the House budget, I believe that we went with a increase in the uh, uh, particular line item uh, for the uh, seniors. I know that uh, protecting our seniors is important and making sure that we keep them out of institutions is also important. I think that they would very much prefer to be uh, in home settings where they're oftentimes much more comfortable. I think that our increases were either, um, they were not quite as uh, generous as the, the governor's. Uh, it was a little bit lower, but still uh, increased from uh, previous. And if you want the actual line item, it'll take me a couple minutes because I did bring a copy of uh, the, with me, a uh, copy of the budget, uh, proposed budget with me. Uh, but even the summary of the budget is a 55-page uh, <laughs> document. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And so it takes a little while to uh, come down. And I'm not sure that in a uh, summary that's only 55 pages. But as I remember, in answer to your question, uh, we uh, were this was something that was important to us. And so we did go with an increase in funding for the coming year. Well, we thank you for that and your participation on the Silver Key Coalition and the advocacy work there, and always appreciate your uh, consideration of our older adults. And you do a t fantastic job with the community area on aging. Uh, I'm you. a little bit jealous of uh, <laughs> you stealing away Terrace Todd from me. He, he's over on the education side of the house of community action, and uh, yes. he has a very responsible position over there, and I miss him around my office. Uh, <laughs> we are blessed to have... Uh, Karen Todd with us and Karen Todd came in uh, just beaming the other day because uh, <laughs> Richard was so kind to her you know she was participating in one of her uh, in one of his uh, uh, prize and she walked away with a box of donuts she won the Sweetwater's Donuts the other day and, and I didn't engineer that that was the call I picked up so Karen won those she was very excited yeah uh, but you do uh, a fantastic job with our seniors uh, I was supposed to be out with you and uh, delivering meals on wheels I want to say yes. about a week ago, and yes. um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make that my, um, th this budget process has been arduous. Um, it is a process that uh, takes a great deal of time. Uh, when I, um, it was about two weeks ago, and I left, I want to say on Tuesday at six o'clock in the morning, I didn't get home until Thursday at eight o'clock at night. Wow. And, uh, yes, there were meetings all day long, and, and we are trying very, very hard to make sure that we protect those who are vulnerable in our society, but we also look out for our taxpayer. We would love to, uh, you know, have, and we are going to. I'm going to have to take lessons from you because you do such a great job. <laughs> Thank well, you, Carla. Thanks, Carla, for the call. 
823. A few more minutes with uh, Dr. Bison today. So uh, we've talked at some length about auto insurance, and it's come up in Detroit recently where uh, I think the mayor said something, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but said something along the lines of the one of the biggest burdens of, of those who live in Detroit is, uh, is auto insurance. Mackinac Center for Public Policy issued a primer not long ago that basically said it's a burden for all of us in the state of Michigan because we're paying some of the highest rates. Do you hear chatter about that in Lansing that uh, maybe we ought to look at that? Uh, that has been a priority in session after session after session. You know, uh, th this has been a perennial topic of discussion because I think that there is general consensus that uh, we ought to be uh, making sure that our citizens can afford uh, the rates. And when you live in the city of Detroit and you come up with a $5,000 uh, policy on, on your uh, vehicle, it, it makes it very hard to do that. Uh, some people will take their cars to uh, their parents' house if their parents are right down the street mm -hmm. and they'll uh, license the cars out there. Uh, it is estimated that about half of the people in the city of Detroit don't even register their, uh, I, I shouldn't say register, uh, don't have their cars insured, yeah. that they yeah. drive uninsured because uh, we have a very, very generous benefit package. And if you ask, is the insurance good? Um, if you are injured in a motor vehicle accident, this is the best insurance in the world. Yeah, the, the uh, catastrophic claims. and Exactly yeah. correct, that uh, this uh, pays. And that made Michigan a place for rehabilitation uh, throughout all of the states. Mm -hmm. If you are injured, then in all probability, one of the things that you're going to do is at least look to Michigan and see what Michigan is doing because they're at the forefront of this because they do quite so much of this. Mm -hmm. uh, but by the same token, it has to be cost effective. It, it has to be reasonable. And uh, I think that um, we do need a fraud authority uh, to try to weed out the bad actors. We do need to enforce the laws that say, yes, you are required to have insurance in Michigan. I think that we need to look at some of the pricing of the repairs as well as the medical procedures, as well as uh, get a great deal more transparency into that MCCA that currently is holding some $20 billion in, mm -hmm. in that fund. Do you think the uh, that we should study the no-fault system? The Mackinac Center thinks that it's uh, it's largely a failure because of uh, of these costs. Do you think we should study that? Uh, if, from the standpoint of costs, yes. You'd always want to have a better product at a lower cost. I don't know of anyone who wouldn't want that. What we have not been able to do is come to a consensus as to how to do that and still protect the uh, vulnerable in our society. And, um, you know, I think that we probably do need to uh, uh, scale back the program, at least to some degree, but... Mm -hmm. I don't think that we ought to pick out uh, good guys and bad guys and say, well, we're going to take this out of the hide of right. X. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that we need a comprehensive review of the entire program, much like we did for energy. And then perhaps uh, there are those who would say uh, that's when you know that you have a good program when nobody likes it. You know, when, you know, <laughs> compromise, you, yeah. you have the compromises and you uh, get down to the point where, um, the insurance companies are not making uh, a, a fortune off of the uh, uh, dollars that are being spent in this particular area, that uh, automotive repairs become uh, back down to what people actually would be paying uh, if they were paying out of pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, that hospital uh, costs would go uh, down as well because there's always the complaint that, uh, that we are doing too much there. Uh, I believe that uh, there is an element of fraud. There is an uh, enforcement issue that I think that we need to uh, address. And, um, you know, if you and the transparency issue for the MCCA. So I, as I said, we have lots of different areas that people have concerns with. And I think that those concerns need to be looked at and they need to be addressed uh, comprehensively. And it seems like whenever you look for that comprehensive answer, that extra little piece of the puzzle makes people drop off of their support for the mm -hmm. overall reform. Mm -hmm. They say, well, I'm going to, you know, if, if this involves that sector, then I'm all in on this. Yeah. But when you say, no, it's going to be comprehensive and everyone needs to be looked at, uh, then you get this one falling off for this reason and that one falling off for that reason. And, 
uh, coming to consensus becomes ever so much harder, and, and that's the challenge that we are facing. Sounds like politics. Well, <laughs> I'm under the impression there's a little bit of that going on up here. That's right. If it were easy, we would have done it by now, I suppose. I'm sure that uh, <laughs> uh, that certainly would be, but it's something that we do need to look at. We need to make sure that uh, we are doing well by our citizens, and even here in district, uh, I am being told that uh, those car insurance rates are becoming increasingly unaffordable, and mm -hmm. uh, I am sure that that's going to push us. And it's not that uh, there isn't the will to do it. There just isn't the consensus. All right. Well, I suppose if the constituency speaks up and, and tells lawmakers they want them to, to look at this, then that's some more motivation. I'm sure that uh, that always helps, gets mm -hmm. things uh, moving. All right. Representative Dr. John Bison, thank you. We'll catch up next month. Thank you so much, Richard. Great right. to see you.